notice them playing over there and you, you sort of listen in a little bit to see what's going on and they're playing church anybody ever had that happen I, I remember playing church when I was a little kid just something really sweet about that you, you see your child somebody's preaching somebody's leading the music and and uh, just so cute um, well Johnny's mother looked out the window and she noticed little Johnny playing church and, and, and noticed that the cat was just sitting there and, and so Johnny was preaching to the cat and she said that she just thought that's the cutest thing and so she went on about her work and, and uh, just, a, just a little while later she heard a loud noise meowing and hissing and all this stuff and she ran back to the, the window and little Johnny was baptizing the cat over and over and over she called out Johnny Johnny stop that the cat's afraid of water and Johnny looked up at her and said well he shouldn't have joined my church then I want you to, to look for Jude next to the last book in the Bible right before Revelation Jude 1 let's look at the first the first chapter of that book and, and we'll go ahead and look at the last chapter Jude 1 and just hold your place there a moment God has exalted his truth as high as his name I want you to think with me the Bible speaks of truth some 224 times he is the God of truth the Bible says that Jesus is full of truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. And, and the Bible said uh, that we are to walk in truth. Jesus said to the Father, your word is truth. So if you're holding God's word, you're holding the truth this morning. We're commanded to worship God in spirit and in what? Truth. We are to obey the truth. We're to love the truth. The Bible teaches us that we are to judge according to the truth. We are to speak the truth. The Bible says speak the truth in love. We are to walk in the truth. We are to proclaim the truth. And so over and over, we're, we're to have our lawns girt about with truth. The Bible speaks of truth. And, and um, if that's the case, which it is, it's no wonder that Satan is always after the truth. He wants to distort the truth, contort the truth. He wants to twist it. He wants to deny it. He wants to, to uh, just in any way he can cover it up. He's a deceiver. He's a liar. And that's what he does. He started that in the Garden of Eden, didn't he? I mean, he went in there and talked to Eve, and he just twisted the truth. Part of it was true, but he twisted it. And in the book of Jude that we're about to look at, we have warnings. You see, we live in a world where Satan is after the truth, and he's using the world and the flesh and the media and and uh, political system and education system and on and on to twist the truth hide the truth but the but the greatest danger of all is from the inside it's when someone posing as a Christian or a preacher or an evangelist is distorting the truth that's very dangerous Satan wins a great victory when somebody comes into the church claiming to be Christian and changes the truth. 3 John 1, 4 says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You know, as a parent, we should have no greater joy than to hear that our children walk in truth or our grandchildren walk in truth or as a church that our children hear walk in truth that our teenagers walk in truth that's what we ought to be striving for so I want to bring a message this morning entitled walk in 
truth and you do have an outline so I encourage you to get the back of the bulletin and fill it in follow along and let the Lord and the Holy Spirit speak to your heart this morning let's stand as we read this scripture Jude 1 I'll begin reading with verse 1 Jude the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied beloved when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ father we just turn the rest of this service over to you we ask for your presence with us we desire your presence we thank you Lord for your presence I thank you Lord for these people these precious souls that are here today thank you for every single person in this room and Lord for uh, the children in children's church those in the nursery and the workers God I thank you for our church but Lord we ask for your help right now speak to us if there's one lost I pray they'd come to know you as Savior and Lord today and not delay but Lord help your your way your will be done today in Jesus name amen Jude. Jude wanted to write about salvation. Jude wanted to write about that glorious gospel that Jesus came and lived and died and, and died on the cross and shed his blood and he rose from the grave. That's what Jude wanted to write. Maybe a book of theology, something like Romans. That's what he wanted to do. But the Holy Spirit said no. No, here's what I want you to write. I want you to warn the people of what's going on. I want you to tell them they need to earnestly contend for the faith. And so that's what Jude did. By the way, if the Lord ever tells us to go a certain direction, we better go. If he says don't go a certain place, don't go. It's just not best. We need to listen carefully and be in tune to the Holy Spirit. Uh, if we need to speak to someone, we better speak to them. Uh, we need to tell somebody about Jesus. We need to do it. And the Holy Spirit helps us to know and directs, directs us. So, so that's what he did. He, he, uh, he wrote and warned. And you might want to underline that earnestly. We should earnestly contend for the faith because that's really, that's the gist of this book, Jude. It's in verse 3. You should earnestly contend for the faith. In other words, you've got to sound the warning, Jude. And that's what I want to do this morning for the next few minutes. I want to share with you some uh, some things and the first one is this the danger of apostasy the danger of apostasy verse 4 says for there are certain men crept in unawares do you see it there are certain men crept in the word crept means snuck in slipped in uninvited deceptive kind of like termites you know they just come in they sneak in they don't give any sound any warning by the way <laughs> they just get in there and eat up the foundation of your house. That's the way these guys are. When I was a young boy, and, and I don't know if any of y'all are going to relate to this or not, but we didn't have many channels on TV, one or two. It was black and white. Yeah, I know, I don't look that old. But it was just black and white TV. And, and uh, every Saturday morning, Brother Jeff, we'd get up early to watch Tarzan. Tarzan. Oh, it was exciting. Uh, regular things it would be hard to get the boy the kids up but boy to watch Tarzan now how many of them can relate to what I just said well there's quite a few you bunch of old people all right well anyway we'd get up uh, and three boys in, in our house and boy we didn't want to miss Tarzan well one of the things that would happen is that he'd be out there swimming uh, swimming in, in, in the water and everything and by the way the best Tarzan was Johnny Weissmuller all right yeah I'm glad y'all know that and he really was an Olympic swimmer won five gold medals Johnny Weissmuller he was he was Tarzan uh, you know around his hat that I you know I shouldn't share this but around his house his property 
He had a moat in, in, in real life. He had a moat built. He could jump out of his second story window into the pool and swim around the entire property. You can look it up. But uh, anyway, that's just a side note. But on these shows, he would be out there, and guess what? A crocodile would just ease into the water. And he's over there splashing around. He don't notice. And here comes a crocodile. And man, when you're a little feller, you're kind of worried. But Cheetah would sound the warning. And I'm not going to try to imitate Cheetah. But Cheetah would sound the warning, and somehow Tarzan understood Cheetah's talk and, and, and would see this crocodile coming. Now, sometimes it was too late, and he'd turn around, and he'd have to fight with it, and he'd always win. Sometimes he'd take off swimming, and he could outswim him. He was an Olympic swimmer. But Cheetah was the one that sound the warning as this crocodile slipped in. Jude is sounding the warning because apostates, folks, listen, they're slipping in. This has been going on, but it's very common now. There's a lot of them, and I'm going to expose them just a little. I'm going to sound the alarm a little bit this morning, and, but I want you to see there's this serious thing going on every speculation every idea every ideology every theology every philosophy every viewpoint that is against the knowledge of God is a formidable foe we need to be careful and there's a lot of distortion there's a lot of lies out there and Satan's behind it and he loves it that's what he does the Bible says though we walk in the flesh we don't war after the flesh for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The Bible says that we need to cast down, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. So we need to sound the alarm. There's the dangers of apostasy. Number two, let's look at the description of the apostate. The description of of the apostate what are they like look at verse 4 for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation notice that phrase right there they were marked out they were foretold listen these folks don't catch God by surprise none of them have there's been a lot of false teachers and preachers and, and, and people that are distorting the truth. And boy, they're real common now in the colleges and universities and now in high school and even in grade school that are distorting the truth, changing the truth to a lie. This, none of this catches God off guard. He knew about it all along. We have to sound the, the warning, though, that they were marked out. And then notice their character in verse 4. They're ungodly men. The Bible says they have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. From such, turn away. Get away from them. Ungodly means without reverential awe. Now, I want you to get this. Without reverence for God. Folks, that's rampant in society. Without any reverence for God. Without any awe of God. Without any respect for God without any fear of God it's rampant and now people even make fun of God not only do they not fear God they make jokes about God they make jokes about Christ they take uh, God's name in vain and Jesus Christ's name in vain and it's become common folks they're gonna pay for that they're gonna be held accountable for that our God is an awesome God he reigns in heaven above and he's in charge and we need to give him all glory all praise we need to understand he's sovereign and he's in control and these people are not recognizing there's no respect for God Boy, I, I've said this before but it's getting where you can't hardly watch anything any, any modern thing on TV because there's no respect for God and then you notice their conduct. It says in verse 4, they turning, they're turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Wait a minute. Grace is one of the most marvelous truths in the Bible. God's amazing grace. The greatest song perhaps ever written, definitely the one most sung, Amazing Grace. 
how sweet the sound but it says they they're turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness now we don't use that word all the time what is lasciviousness that means unbridled lust get this they're turning the grace the awesome grace the amazing grace into unbridled lust did you hear that what does that mean well some of these people and we're talking about false teachers false prophets evangelists people on television people on the radio some of them are turning the grace of God into lust lust for power lust for greed lust for greed lust for fame for money lust for control remember Jim Jones he was controlling some thousand people the wacko from Waco controlling people so they're lusting after this the Bible says all that's in the world the lust of the flesh that's where a lot of them are the lust of the eyes the pride of life it's not of the father it's wicked so they have no reverence but they also have no restraint they live any way they want to you know what it is they're pretenders they're not truly possessors of the grace of God and of the glory of God and the love of God and salvation and boy this is just common now you know you preach about the judgment of God and the warnings of God and preach on hell and preach on sin and and all those things and boy people get their feathers ruffled real quick matter of fact they won't stand for it but these people they're 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 turning grace now we're saved by grace but listen to this scripture Titus 2 11 says for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should live soberly righteously uh, and godly in this present world the Bible says in Romans 6 what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound God forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein no they're turning grace into disgrace they're calling it grace they're turning it into lasciviousness and that's going on today and here's the here's the kicker here's where I'm headed with all this they're doing this under the banner of the church of Christianity of, of sounding the call they're Christians but they're deceivers and I want to share with you some quotes this morning they're direct quotes from some present day preachers some matter of fact all of these I'm going to give you are on television they have shows on television and masses are listening to them now listen I'm, I'm going to share with you seven number one though we see though we are not almighty God this is a direct quote though we are not almighty God himself nevertheless we are divine we are now divine you are a little God running around on earth that is a direct quote now I know where that comes from there's a quote in the Old Testament says you're gods and there's a quote in the New Testament Jesus said you're gods but the word the teaching the truth of it is that you are magistrates you are judges you have authority God's given us authority he certainly didn't say you're a God how foolish is that how wicked is that there's one true God and we worship him we serve him we love him we give him all glory you see what happens to people that believe they're a God they're due they believe worship and that's what's going on they, they're due following follow me and that's what's going on number two here's another one and by the way, the one who said this next one I'm fixing to read, according to Forbes research, their net worth is $42 million. Okay, that's the net worth. That's pretty good. That's more than I've got. But, but, but here it is. No, I am not wealthy. This is a public quote. No, I am not wealthy. You know what? I thought about that. And probably in his mind, he's not. He's looking for $42 billion. So in his eyes, he's probably not wealthy. But he says, no, I am not wealthy. P 
poverty, and he goes on to say, and this is a, again a quote, poverty is from the devil, and God wants all Christians prosperous. Folks, that's a lie. That's just not true. That's not God's desire for us to all be wealthy. That's not his plan. Man, that would mess us up big time. <laughs> a lot of us, if we would get so distracted taking care of our money, we wouldn't have time for God. We wouldn't need to trust him. We wouldn't need to call on him because we've got it all, right? So it would mess up a lot of people. That's not his plan. Look at who he exalted. Remember the widow that gave the might? She, and and what, did, what did the Lord say? She's given more than anybody. He was, he was lavishing her with praise. She's the one that I've got my eye on. She's the one. He didn't say, see, she's not living right or she would have a lot of money. No, he didn't say that. How about Mary when she took the most precious thing materially she had and she broke it and she lavished it on Jesus? What did he say? Leave her alone. She's done what she could. He took up for her. He didn't say, see, she's not living right or she'd have more money. How foolish is this? The third one, and this is a different preacher, by the way. This is not the same one. He said this, and this one is, this one, according to Forbes, is worth 40 million he says this if I give a thousand dollars I deserve to get back a hundred thousand because I am just that is not greed he said so if I give a thousand I deserve to get a hundred thousand folks we don't want to talk about what we deserve we don't want to go there we don't want what we deserve none of us want what we deserve Here's another one. Quote. This again, television preacher. Classical theology has erred in its insistence that theology be God-centered, not man-centered. Did you get that? Classical theology has erred in its insistence that theology be God-centered and not man-centered. We've erred. What is sin? Sin is... And this is, I'm quoting, sin is an act or thought that robs myself or another human being of his or her self-esteem. I know, it's, it's, it makes you laugh, except it ought to make us cry. Because here's the sad thing, people are buying into these, these guys, these false teachers. Here's another one. What is hell? A person is in hell when he has lost his self-esteem. He's in hell when he's lost his self-esteem. Then he says this, God has the power to take life, but he can't. And then I think he, he changed a little bit. He's got the power to do it, but he won't. He's bound. <laughs> he's bound. And then he says it again, he can't. He says death and life are in the power of whose tongue? Yours. Death and life are in the power of your tongue? Excuse me? My God is in control of life and death. He's the giver of life. He takes life according to his glory. He's in charge. We're not. And, and, and your tongue is not in charge. Number six, you choose when you live. You choose when you die. I don't know, but I didn't, I didn't really have anything to do with it when I, when I started living. <laughs> my, my dad and mom were involved, but I don't think I was. Death and life are in the, listen, death and life is in the power of your tongue not God's I would be afraid to say this stuff it says this and again I'm quoting now he's got the power talking about God but he will not exercise that because you are a speaking spirit so he says speak life boy you got a lot of power there you can speak life God really can't do it you can one more this is the most bizarre maybe of all. God made animals and, and did not have the foggiest idea of what they were. 
he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. He didn't know what it was. He just made something. But see, Adam is a speaking spirit. You, you know, you're taking the glory and the power and the omnipotence away from God and giving it all to man. But folks, listen, that's by design. It's called humanism. It's where we are our own gods. That's where all this stuff is. And now people, they break down the, the teaching about how awesome God is and how powerful God is and that it's all about God. They try to whack away on that and then they set up for it's all in your mind. You're in control. You decide it's all in your hands. It's humanism. And then we go a little further. There are churches today, many churches, that are not only, not only are they avoiding the subject to teach how wrong homosexuality is, the Bible says it's an abomination. It's an abomination against God. Let's be real clear. But not only are they not teaching that, which is horrible, they're ordaining homosexuals to ministry in their church, in their denominations. They're ordaining homosexuals. Can you believe where we've come? And many of them think they're right, and they'll argue. There are churches that do not condemn premarital sex, fornication, and adultery, promiscuity. They'll never say anything against it. There are churches who say nothing against abortion and even condone abortion and even support abortion clinics churches can you believe this I'm trying to sound the alarm folks I'm trying to let you know what's going on in many churches not just in Houston but around the world around the country and certainly around the world have you ever heard of the pub theology there are churches in many states that meet in bars and serve alcohol did you know that's going on it's called pub theology there are many churches meeting in bars serving liquor have you ever heard of beer in the Bible oh yes let's get together Thursday nights beer in the Bible or beer in hymns that's another one you got that one in Portland how about this one church in a pub in Fort Worth Texas here's one what would Jesus brew in Michigan in, in Michigan here's the bar church in DC here's one in Boston this is their welcoming message Welcome to the pub church. We're a church in a pub and the Spirit is with us. Folks, that's blasphemy. That is blasphemy. In this place, feel free to move about, help yourself to food and drink, and express yourself openly. Don't you think that if Jesus would go into the temple and overturn the tables and run out the money changers, don't you think he would do that in these places? You call yourself a church? no way I mean he's not gonna put up with that but folks listen he's not gonna put up with that but we've got to sound the alarm because a lot of people are looking for something different they're looking for something different don't want church the same old same old well listen I'm with them on, on one thing I don't want dead church I don't want lifeless church. I don't want stale church. I don't want any of that. But to look for something different if it's worldly and godly and fleshly, no, that's not it. That's what Satan wants you to do. So we see the dangers. We see a description. And then number three, the destruction of the apostates. The destruction of the apostates. I will therefore put you in remembrance. Though you once knew this, Hey, let me just say one thing right here. This is a lesson for us. I was just talking about it, really. It's not, it's not the preacher's job to come up with something you've never heard of before. That's not my job. You know what my real job is? It's to remind you of what's in the Bible. It's to remind you and me of the teaching, of the principles, of the precepts. And that's what he says. I put you in remembrance. I want to remind you of something. Jude is saying, you already know this. What is he, I, we're not going to read this, but he gives three examples. He reminds them of Israel coming out of bondage. And then he reminds them of the angels that were kicked out of heaven, third of them. 
And then he reminds them of Sodom and Gomorrah when God rained down judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's just look at one real quick. Let's look at verse 5. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, having destroyed them that believed not. Many of them were sincere in their faith, but not all of them. Here's what I want you to get. They had religious experience. Every one of these people did. Think about it. They sacrificed. Every family, all the Jews, before they came out of Egyptian bondage, they sacrificed an animal. And remember what they did with the blood? They put it up on the doorpost, the mantle, remember? And the death angel passed by, and if he saw the blood, he passed by, remember? And he didn't destroy him. All of them had that religious experience, every one of them. And then they went out, and guess what? God parted the Red Sea, right? They all experienced that, every one of them. They had a religious experience. And God led them in a fire by night and a cloud by day. That was God's leading, and they all were involved with that. And we could go on and on, the manna and many other things. They all had religious experience, and yet many did not believe, and they were destroyed. God opened up the the earth and swallowed them. Why? Because they were apostates. They fell away, even though they had religious experience. I want to share something with you. And it's it's this. Looking back is not the best place to get assurance of salvation. You see, if it were, those people would have looked back at what God did. And they would have, oh, I'm saved. Because I put the blood there and death angel didn't get us. I'm saved. I was there and went through the Red Sea. I'm saved. Now stay with me. I don't want to confuse anybody, that's for sure. But looking back is not the best place for assurance of salvation. And I want to read this so I can get it accurately. Dr. Adrian Rogers wrote wrote this about assurance, and and I, I agree with him. He says this, So far as I can tell in searching the Bible, nowhere does the Bible ever tell us to look back to some experience for the assurance of salvation. He goes on to say that that doesn't mean that you weren't saved at that time you're looking back. But that's not where you go for assurance. If you want to know you're saved, you need to look at today, present. The proof of your salvation ought to be sitting in your chair. The proof of your salvation right now is the person believing in Christ and Christ only. Christ always for salvation. Is Jesus Christ real to you today? Do you have a changed life? Is your life changed? Does God's Spirit bear witness with your spirit that you are the child of God? This is, I I believe he's totally 100% right because, again, all these people could look back and they would have been deceived because many were not saved. Many were destroyed. And I got to close out. The defense against apostasy, number four. Let me just give you five things. Number one, submit to the truth. Submit to the truth. What does that mean? That just means you've got to be saved. You've got to be saved. If you want protection, you've, you've got to be born again. You've got to make sure that you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. And then your life is changed. You're different. You're not the same. Secondly, study the truth. First of all, submit to the truth. Secondly, study the truth. How do you increase your faith? studying the Bible faith cometh by hearing hearing by the word of God studying the word got to get in the word I mean that's one of the problems with many who are calling themselves Christians and maybe who are Christians some who are Christians I mean they think the epistles are the wives of the apostles if I said turn to Hezekiah they'd turn it's not in there the book of Hezekiah I'm not trying to make fun of anybody I know there's some young Christians but we need to be studying the battle, it, it, it's important. The battle is over inerrancy and, and the, the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to know these things. We've got to study. We've got to know that salvation is by grace through faith and that not of yourselves. Number three, study the truth or see. Uh, show the truth. Show the truth. You know, the best argument for your salvation is it's you. For or against. It's you. 
It's how you live your life. It's the real you. When you're alone or when you're in public. And D, stand for the truth. If there's ever a day we need to stand firm and stand strong, it's today. We need to stand up and say, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith God's word. That's what I'm standing on. I'm standing on God's word. I'm not standing on on man's uh, opinions. On God's word. We need to say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Parents, we've got to be parents. We've got to be in, we've got to be the leader of our home under God's leadership, under God's authority. And then lastly, share the truth. Share the truth in love. We always talk about keep the faith. Maybe we need to give it away. Give it to somebody. Share it. Share it with someone else. Tell other people about Christ. Listen, apostates were here when you wrote this letter. And they're here today, but I believe it's escalating. I believe the Bible teaches that. Escalates, it escalates, it gets worse, it gets worse. And we see it with the breakdown of the home and family and marriage. It's escalating. The longer Christianity exists in the world, the more corrupt the pretenders become. We've got to walk in truth. Would you stand with your heads bowed and your eyes closed? I want to ask you this morning, is there someone here that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ? You're not saved. If you died today, you don't know for sure you'd go to heaven. Would you come and I'll be at the front and we'll share with you how you can be saved, how you can know you have eternal life. The Lord will change your life, give you a reason to live. Maybe you need a church home. Maybe... You need to repent of some sin that you've got in your life. Whatever God wants you to do, be obedient as we sing.